the moment of truth has come. However, you know, I think we should do away with the tradition and have the sermon at the beginning of our service and that it would save so much agonising when you're sitting there in that middle chair. Never mind. A few months ago, I got to thinking what I could use for a sermon or a topic if Gary should ask me to do a sermon. Then one word just came to me, and that word was signs. Is it just a coincidence that in the last three weeks there have been tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, and awful things that have been happening in these countries, islands round about us? All the, all the problems associated with earthquakes and tsunamis, we really haven't felt these problems, have we? And they could come upon us unawares as they did in Samoa and in Indonesia and in the Philippines. There's just so many things that are happening and just sort of one after another, sometimes at the same time. How would we feel if we were, had this problem that came upon us? We all look for signs. When you live in a place long enough, you get to know which way the rain is going to come. If you've got your washing on the line, you sort of think, oh, well, it might be okay because the, the rain is coming in a different direction. If you're outside working in your garden and the sand flies are biting you, you know then that rain is not far behind. And if you're going shopping, you prepare yourself because, well, if you're wise, you will, you've got a list and you go and check in your cupboard to see if there are signs of things running out. And before you do, if you're wise, you will also go and have a look at the indicator on your petrol gauge to see that you have got enough petrol to go where you want to go and you won't be embarrassed. If you have children that are going to school, you'll be interested to see their reports because you will want to know how well they're doing. And the report will give you a sign as to whether they're doing well or whether they're not. And then if you've got money burning a hole in your pocket and you want to invest that money, you might be very wise if you would look at the situations where you're thinking about putting your money into. If you want to buy property, you'll be looking around for the signs that say, well, it's a good idea. If you want to put your money in a bank, it's probably the safest place to put it. But um, if you want to invest money in the stock market, you're wise to check out the signs of the current situation. If signs of age are creeping upon you and your hair is going white or it's falling out, you'll be quickly making a decision. Will you go to the dye pot or would you just let nature take its course? If you're in a foreign country or city, you rely on the street names or maps. And if you're really up with it, you'll have a GPS to help you because we know, my husband and I know from experience how difficult it can be finding your way, particularly in the, in the city of Miami when we were there all because of the cyclones that had come through, <clears throat> the place names on the streets had fallen off. And so you might have it going, the street name going one way and the direction of the road is going in the opposite way. We're all aware of the changing seasons that are around at the moment. We're coming into springtime and there's new grass and the grass is growing like crazy. And the sparrows may be there wanting to build their house in your spouting. Or if you suffer from arthritis and rheumatism and the weather has been terrible and wet all through the winter, you'll be looking forward to signs of warmer weather so that that pain and ache might be going on its way. Pain can be a blessing. You know it's a sign something is wrong. It's the insidious things like cancers that can be growing inside of you and you know nothing about them whatsoever. No signs or symptoms. How many people when faced with a dilemma ask Jesus for a sign so they can make the right decision as to what is the Lord's will? I was interested when Jamie Jorg was here the other week or so back, how that he was in a dilemma. He didn't know what the Lord wanted him to do. 
He was, he'd done some time try, um, learning to be a doctor, then he'd done some ministerial, I'm not sure of the order of that, and he just didn't know what he should do, whether he should be a musician or not. He asked the Lord to give him a sign as to what he should do, medical career, ministerial, or use his musical ability. He got his, <clears throat> his answer when someone completely out of the blue said to him, Jamie, why are you playing around with these other things? God has given you a talent and you should be using it. When Adam and Eve <clears throat> were banished from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, God sent holy angels to debar them from the garden. Around these angels flashed beams of light on every side. They gave the appearance of glittering sword. Was that a sign of a barrier between God and them? Incidentally, in Patriots and Prophets, page 62, it says that the Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon their previous home. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by flood, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. Noah was instructed of God to build a boat large enough to contain as many people wanted to go in and all the animals and birds. Noah warned the people for 120 years that destruction was coming upon the earth. Surely that this was... Well, wait a minute, I'd better go back a wee bit here. Noah warned the people for 120 years and when the animals and the birds were directed into the ark by an unseen hand, the people looked on in wonder and started to think. Some in fear. Surely this was a sign that something was about to happen. The door of the ark was closed by unseen hands. Noah and his family shut in, rejectors of God's mercy shut out. Seven days, nothing happened. There in the boat, those in the boat were tested. Those outside triumphed and mocked. A flog, flo uh, flood would never come upon us. Oh, well, they hadn't even known what rain was, so what would a flood be? But on the eighth day, the rain commenced. Small drops at first, then thunder and lightning. There followed unbelievable scenes when the waters from the deep sprung up. In their dying hours, they must have wished they had taken heed to the warnings and the signs that had been shown them. <clears throat> Noah had been in the ark for five long months. They had been tossed about by every wind and wave. Then the raven was sent out to see if there was any dry spot, but no the raven came back in because there was no place for it to land. Another seven days, and a dove was sent out, and the bird returned with an olive leaf. Still, Noah waited. And at last an angel descended from heaven and opened the massive doors. The family were able to come outside, and they sacrificed one of the animals that had been with them in the boat because there was no other way they could sacrifice and it was a time of thankfulness and sacrifice. The Lord sent a rainbow as a sign that no more would water cover the earth. Eliezer, Abraham's trusted servant, was sent on a journey to find a wife for Isaac. Such a tricky assignment. So he asked for a sign so he could know for sure who was the chosen bride for Isaac. Eliezer arrived at the town of Nahor. He went to the well and had his camels kneel down. And then he prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham, let her be the one you have chosen to be the wife of Isaac, the one who not only offers to give me water, but is going to offer water for my camels as well. Is it wrong <clears throat> to ask God for a sign? No, I don't think it is wrong because you can be in such a dilemma you do not know which to turn. 
and you're very reliant upon God to direct you in the way that he would want you to go. Then there was Jacob. He was weary from his journey because he had run away from home, hadn't he? Run away from his father and his mother, but more particularly his brother Esau. And he was very weary. He laid down and used a stone for a pillow. And he dreamt of a ladder reaching from earth to heaven. Angels on the ladder, descending and ascending. The ladder represented Jesus, the angels taking the prayers to God, and angels bringing the blessings down from God. The dream was a sign to Jacob that though he had sinned, God was still with him. Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep near a place called Horeb. There he saw the burning bush, which didn't burn up. Moses went to investigate, and the Lord spoke to him. I have seen the trouble the Israelites are suffering in Egypt, and I, the Lord, want you, Moses, to lead them out. What a task. Moses replied, I'm not enough to do that. I can't speak. But God had an answer for him. God replied, I will be with you and take your rod with you. And Aaron, who will be your spokesman, is already on his way to meet you. What about the plagues that eventually <clears throat> came upon the people in Egypt? These plagues came upon them because Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelites leave Egypt. I suppose you can't blame him because, after all, the Israelites were at their workforce, weren't they? However, signs of God's displeasure when these plagues were shown and experienced by Pharaoh and all the people in Egypt, not the Israelites. Now, the children of Israel were to celebrate the Passover. They were to take the blood of the Passover lamb and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of their houses. They had specific instructions on how to cook the Passover lamb. The bread was significant too. No yeast or rising element was to be put in the bread. Their cloaks were to be on them and they, and the cloak was to be tucked into their belt and the sandals on their feet and staff in their hands. Exodus 12 and verse 13 says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This was a very trying time for the Israelite people and the Egyptians. Moses went before Pharaoh with the last message. You know, all these plagues had occurred, and the last one was that the firstborn would die if they were not if they didn't heed the instruction. Pharaoh had been warned. He knew what was going to happen. Probably he didn't believe it. The children of Israel were to obey, obey implicitly the instruction given, or, would they, or they would have been affected also. So many signs during the wanderings of the children of Israel. <clears throat> well, there was the parting of the Red Sea. There was the... Food continually, day after day after day. There was their water that was sure. Their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never wore out. All these things that happened showed that the Lord was with them. Another very important instruction given to the children of Israel was when God called Moses to come to the mountain, Mount Sinai. <clears throat> the Ten Commandments were given. In particular, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus 31, 12. You must observe my Sabbaths. And this will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come. So you may know that I am the Lord who made you holy. Then there was the time when God wanted to have a closer relationship with the children of Israel, so he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Special instructions were given on to how to make the furniture for this tabernacle. It all had a meaning. Special clothes for Aaron and his sons because they were to serve as priests. 
There was special embroidery of blue, purple and scarlet yarn put on the round the hem of the high priest's garment. Gold bells were attached also. Aaron was to wear this special robe when he ministered as the high priest. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out so that he will not die, he was told that if the people were not prepared and they had to give time to preparation for confessing their sin, they had to wash their bodies, they had to, for this particular time, the Day of Atonement, and when the high priest in, went into the most holy place, they could hear the bells tinkling. And then there was a time of quiet when the Lord accepted the sacrifice and the contrition of the people. And the people waited and waited and listened because they wanted to know if they would hear the bells again. They were listening for those bells because the high priest in the most holy place would have been struck dead. And so they were all with one accord and they were listening for these bells on the high priest's robe when he came out again. There must have been great rejoicing when all was well. <clears throat> Further down the line of history is the story of Rahab. Joshua had sent two young men as spies to go into the town city of Jericho to spy out the things that were there, <clears throat> its resources, its population, and the strength of the fortification. Jericho was one of the principal places for idol worship. Here was centred all that was vile and most degrading. The religion of the Canaanites was not good. Joshua withdrew from the encampment to meditate and pray. He didn't specifically ask for a sign, but he got a, something better than a sign because Jesus himself stood before him and said, I have given into your hand Jericho. Now the inhabitants of Jericho were constantly on the lookout and the spies were in great danger. They were, however, preserved by Rahab, a lady of ill repute, I believe the roofs were made of straw and she hid the spies in the roof of her house. Could do that by lifting up the straw, the straw. She pleaded with the spies to spare her life and her family when told that Jericho was going to be doomed. They told her that if she tied the scarlet cord by which she was going to let them down to safety to her window, her life and that of her family would be spared. That scarlet cord represents the blood of Jesus. When the city of Jericho was demolished, only Rachel and Rahab, sorry, and her family were saved. <clears throat> she was obedient to the instructions, and the Israelites gave regard to that scarlet cord. There are innumerable stories in the Bible of signs that God has given to his leaders. Think of Elijah, think of um, Gideon, Abraham, Daniel, just to name just a few. But, you know, in Amos there is a verse that says, I know it so well, and I've written it down, that the Lord God will do nothing except he will let his servants, the prophets, know what is going to come upon them. What about the signs that were seen in Jesus' day? His birth was a sign of God's intervention in world's history. <clears throat> and when Jesus came to be baptised of John, his cousin whom he had never met, John knew who he was immediately. As soon as Jesus was baptised and came up out of the water, at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove lighting upon him. The presence of the Trinity was evident. God the Father spoke, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The dove represented the Holy Spirit and God the Son was baptised. All who witnessed Jesus' miracles were amazed and flocked to hear his teaching. People's lives changed. Surely the miracles of bringing people back from the dead must have had a profound effect on people, a wonderful sign of his special powers. 
When Jesus performed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, this was a sign that people, they actually got their wires quite crossed. This man could supply all their physical needs. He could lead them against the Roman authorities. He could heal all the diseases. He could set up a new kingdom and do away with the hated Roman leaders. But one day, after Jesus had spent the entire night in prayer, when it was time in the time of Gethsemane, he passed, he was on his way, he'd spent the whole night in prayer, and then he passes a fig orchard, and he was hungry, and in the distance he saw a fig tree that had leaves, and though this tree gave promise of well-developed fruit, there was none to be found. Even though he searched it from the low branches to the very top, there was no fruit there. There was just a mass of pretentious foliage, nothing more. And he cursed the tree. This was an unusual thing for Christ to do. But it was an act of parable. The fig tree was a symbol of the Jewish nation. They had been specifically favoured, but they received him not. How about the Adventist church? With all the knowledge and the blessings we've been given as a church, are we just an empty can or a clanging symbol? Religious leaders ask Jesus for a sign. Have a look in Matthew chapter 16, 1 to 3. Matthew 16, 1 to 3. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting to side him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Do we know how to interpret the signs of the times? Do we see, if, see things and hear things happening today that make us twink, tw think twice or make us <clears throat> quake in our boots? Or are we in a kind of stupid, lulled by false, insecu false security? When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't especially ask for a sign, but God sent him one anyway. He knew what was going to happen to him, even though, if it were possible, that this cup might pass from me. The mighty angel who stands in God's presence came and supported him, not to take away the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it. The angel brought him the assurance from God of God's love and to give him the strength to withstand the terrible trial before him. When the disciples met with Jesus in the upper room after, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, Thomas was not present. He had heard reports of others and received abundant proof that Jesus had risen, but he didn't believe. Gloom and unbelief filled his heart. The disciples had made the upper room their temporary home and at evening, all except Thomas, had gathered there. But one evening, Thomas determined that he would meet with the rest of them. And then Jesus arrived through closed doors and he stood and came in the midst of them. And he said to Thomas, reach with your fingers and behind my hands and reach your hand and thrust it into my side. Thomas had previously said, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. This was undoubtedly a sign Thomas would never forget. He cast himself <clears throat> at the feet of Jesus, crying, my Lord and my God. I think of the people when the tsunami hit recently, they had to run to high ground. No time to collect clothes, passports, money or anything. They just had to go. It's an eerie feeling 
when, you're not when you've not experienced anything like this. I have a memory of when I was in Papua New Guinea many years ago when I was nursing there. And I was sitting at the table at lunchtime and we, you could look out on the water. It was not far away at all. And we looked out and we could see that there was something rather strange. The water had, the tide was far, far out, far more than it had ever, we'd ever, ever seen it before. And we just sort of had that feeling, something isn't right. Now, this is back in the days of no phones, we had no radio, nothing to tell us what the trouble was. We later learned that there were earthquakes in some of the islands not too far away. <clears throat> the sea then was mild in comparison, in comparison to what we've heard of lately. The earth is waxing old like a garment. If you read Matthew 24, there's so much in it. You need to read it and read it again. Verse 42 says, Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Verse 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So make your calling and election sure. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7 says, The Lord is good in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. So let us sing our last hymn, which is Face to Face with Christ my Saviour, hymn 206. Father in heaven, as we see the things that are happening round about us, Lord, they are sobering thoughts to us. And we need to make sure that we are ready for when Jesus does come back. Help us at all times to remember that you have given the sacrifice for us and that you will be so happy when you see the people that you have died for in the earth made new. Please us each one and help us to remember the words of Matthew 24, Lord, and help us to remember that we are yours and we look to you for leading at all times. For Jesus' sake, amen.